Sam had been working in a very crowded office at the Army. He noticed that they were running out of room for filing all their things, and, and on his own, he started evaluating where they might be able to create some room for all the new files. He happened to notice that there were three very large four-drawer file cabinets held an awful lot of files, but those files were absolutely stuffed full, and no one was using them. In fact, in the, in the, they, they were at least 20 years old, the files, and he'd noticed that for over two years that he'd worked there, no one had ever opened one of the drawers except for him trying to see if he, there was any space in there. He thought, well, maybe I could get those removed and get rid of them. Then I'd have room for new files. So he talked to his superior. His superior then told him he needed to submit a written request to dispose of the old files so he could make room for the new files and new documents. After several weeks of going back and forth with communications regarding how old the files were, whether they were classified or declassified, what the use was for them, he finally got word back that he could shred all of the old documents, all those old files, but first he would need to follow Army protocol making triplicate copies of every old document, then keeping and filing two copies of every old document and sending one copy to storage. Protocol. We've always done it that way. Conform to the standards. Sometimes having to conform to the world or the military things is an absolutely horrible thing. When I was looking for some jokes about conformity uh, and conforming to standards, I found two statements that I really liked. One of them, just be yourself like everyone else. Or number two, I am protesting against conformity. Who is with me? <laughs> As we continue this series of sermons that Brother Jared started for us about walking the path, walk the path, I want to consider what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, about our need to be conformed to the image of the Son. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Let's start, though, with prayer. Lord, I ask that you would help us to realize there's only two ways to be conformed, either conformed to the world or conformed to Jesus. You've told us to be conformed to Jesus. Let us be conformed to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. When I meditate upon what it means to become conformed to the image of his son, Jesus, I think about several things, starting out with the fact that the Bible tells us we really have just two choices, our two choices that we have. The first of these choices is that we could be conformed to the world and its ways. When you look over in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and over in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3, Paul wrote this to the Christians there in Rome. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Verse 2 here. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. How do we know if somebody's conformed to this world? Well, literally, that means that you fashion yourself like and you are uh, like the world. You know, if you look at the Amish people, they have really taken this command to not be conformed to this world. They have taken extreme measures that their people have to follow certain dress codes and they have to be willing to forbid the use of uh, mechanical modern machinery. And yet, you can tell the Amish who the Amish are just by one glance at their clothing or if they're riding in their little horse-drawn buggy. It's pretty obvious. And what I find really interesting about that is if you compare these people to people in the 18th century or the early 19th century, they look like they are conformed to this world. They just haven't gotten up to the modern world. And I think about this over and over. Paul was not addressing what kind of clothing you have, your outward clothing or your modes of transportation. He is addressing the thoughts of the world. Today's world, Christians being conformed to the world would be those who do not stand solid upon the word of God. Instead, they adopt the worldly viewpoints in matters of morality and biblical accuracy. For instance, there are groups of Christians who had conformed to the world in regards to discrediting the Bible, discrediting it, in areas like homosexuality, promiscuity, promiscuity, sexual sins. 
They say the Bible's teaching is outdated. It needs to be updated. It needs to be modernized to fit in today's world. Instead of the Bible being true, they feel, they teach the Bible's wrong, and so they conform to the world and the world's sense of morality or what the Bible would call immorality. Other Christians actually deny the accuracy of the Bible. Oh yeah, we know what Genesis says. We know that it says that God created the world in six literal 24-hour days of creation, but instead they will want to combine evolutionary theories and, and tales and mixing truth with God's uh, uh, truth, mixing the world's falsehood in with it. Still other Christians had conformed to the world's ideas and thinking that, you know, just one little sin, that, that's not so bad. Or it really doesn't matter what you do. You don't have to tithe. You don't really need to put God first in your life. And they create their own, what I would call their own religion. And it's a mixture of worshiping God with a mixture, maybe even a little bit or even a huge portion of human philosophy and worldly doctrines. They have conformed to this world. Are we conformed to this world? When Paul wrote to the Christians in Ephesus, he wrote these words in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. In other words, you were conformed to this world. According to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of our flesh and of our mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest in other words Paul was pointing out who is ruling you do you live for the lusts of your flesh and the desires of your flesh in your mind are we all about ourselves and entertaining ourselves it was many years ago back when I was a youth that I had a man challenge me to to write down everything I spent and then submit it to him how I spent my money and he took that and he went through and he looked at it and said, I know what's most important in your life. If someone looked at your checkbook, if they looked at your register on your, your debit card, if they looked at your bank account, what would they say is most important in your life? What do you spend the most money on? You know, for most of us, we spend most of our money on housing, house payments, insurance payments, utilities, etc. Then some people spend money on vehicle payments and fuel and maintenance and repairs. And then perhaps our next biggest expense is groceries. But then where is our money going? New clothes so we can always look great? Movies, cable, TV, entertainment? Where is God in this list of how we spend our money? Where is helping others? You know, you can examine your money, your checkbook, your ledger, and you can see a whole lot about that. And if God is looking at it, which I'm sure he is, remember in Jesus telling the story about the widow who has put in her two mites, who was watching that? Jesus. Jesus sees how we spend our money. What do you think God thinks about how we spend our money? What takes the most amount of our time? For most of us, it's work. Well, what do we do with the rest of our time? Is it all about entertainment, watching TV, movies, going out? Where is God in our lives? Do our finances, do our time conform to the world's standards and lifestyles, or do we look different? Is God a huge portion of our life, or just this little portion over here in a corner? What Paul wrote, and I'm using for the main jump-off point for the sermon is, we're starting in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose, verse 29. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of of his son so that he would be firstborn among many brethren we need to become conformed to the image of Christ not conformed to the world but conformed to the image of Christ well what does that mean how are we conformed to the image of Christ 
I fully believe that Paul addresses this later on in Romans when he wrote in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We need a transformation by the Holy Spirit transforming our very minds. We need our minds to be taken totally control of by the Holy Spirit to renew our minds daily and constantly. The world is constantly trying to do everything it can to get us to conform to the world, to the world's ideas, to the world's morality. But we need to keep on daily all the time, working on aligning our minds and our hearts with God and His teachings. I think it was probably 30 years or more ago, my brother actually came out to see me up in Oregon, and he brought some of his friends out. And one day his friend, one of his friends, wanted to take some photos of the area. Is there anything interesting here? And I told him, you know, there's something that's kind of interesting north of Salet. It's a hanging bridge, a suspension bridge that all you can do is walk across it. It's not strong enough for a vehicle. He said, well, can you take me out and show it to me? So I drove him up there, and it's a privately owned bridge. The highway's on the east side of the Siletz River. Their house is on the west side of the Siletz River, and they often use this bridge to get across. Well, we're out there taking photos, not on the bridge, but from the road, taking photos of this, and this truck pulls up. They were the owners of that bridge. They're the family that lived on the other side. And I started talking to him about how this guy's a photographer and he wanted some really interesting pictures. To me, this is one of the most interesting things to see north of town. And, and they said, wow, you like to see this? I got some other things I'd like to have you take some pictures of that are really interesting, like a, a big barn with gigantic clear lumber. We said, sure, we'd like to see it. He said, well, come on, follow me. Let's drive over there. And I'm going like, I know how to get to their house through the woods. Well, that's going to take almost an hour of driving through logging roads to get back there. And I said, I, I don't know how we we're going to drive there. He said, oh, follow me. We have a Fjord. Going like, what's a Fjord? Your car is a Chevy. Your truck is a Chevy. It's not a Fjord. I didn't know what a Fjord was. He said, just follow me. And I'm driving my little gray Toyota. If you don't know what a Fjord is, it's a place where they cross the river. He takes that Chevy of his and he drives down this very, very steep hill through the brush, lands in the river, and starts driving across. Well, I just follow along. I got four-wheel drive. This is going to be fine and easy. But their truck was taller than mine. And we're driving through the Siletz River. The water's coming up halfway on the, on the doors. And I'm looking out my window going, oh, this is getting pretty deep. And then I started noticing the current was taking me <laughs> downstream. Their truck wasn't going downstream, but mine was. And so I started having to turn my steering wheel upstream and trying to keep traction and constantly correcting it, trying to stay behind them. And I started thinking about that. That's a lot like it is with Christianity. The world is always pushing us to go with the flow. Just go with the flow. And we have to be, as Christians, constantly correcting and redirecting so that we can get into the right direction. It's not about just one correction. It's about constant, continual correction, trying to change to get it to go in the right direction. And Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit to be our helper, to be that constant companion to empower us, to give us strength to overcome the evil one and the evil one's lies and deceptions. We need to let the Holy Spirit shield us and protect us. We need the Holy Spirit to constantly and continually take control of our mind and protect us and guide us into the right directions. We need transformation. Years ago, I had a youth up in Oregon who wanted to preach. I, I was encouraging him to preach a sermon. He was kind of a, a guy who really liked to talk, wanted to teach a lesson. I said, why don't you prepare a sermon for us? He goes, well, what would I preach on? I said, what is dear to your heart? Well, back then, he loved the Transformers. Transformer movies. And I said, well, preach about Transformers. Transformation. Use this passage right here in Romans 12. 
about this transformation, and, and he just absolutely loved Transformers. If you don't know what Transformers are, they're, they're these little toys that look like a truck or they look like a car, and then you open them up and fold them, and they become a robot. And there was a movie about these, and these robots were really powerful. And, and I told him, just preach on this passage and relate it to your Transformers, your toys in the movies. And that's what he did, and it was an excellent sermon. I, I kept thinking about this. This is what we need to let the Holy Spirit do to us. Not into a powerful robot. Oh, yeah, you brought, yeah. We need to become powerful people for God. With our minds centered upon Jesus. With our eyes looking to Christ. With our hearts focused on righteousness. We can't, though, just say, well, you know what? I think I'll let the Holy Spirit do all the work. <laughs> No, we also need to purposefully be choosing to be like Jesus. The Holy Spirit is given to each and every Christian when we were baptized. That's the promise that's found in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. And since the Holy Spirit of God is so powerful to be able to change and renew our minds and transform our minds, why is it that some Christians are still being conformed to the world? I believe it's because some Christians are just plain too lazy to go against the flow of the world. They're too scared of looking different, to acting different, to speaking different, to behaving differently in the world. Too many Christians want Jesus to be their Savior, but they don't want Jesus to be Lord. I don't want him to be boss. I don't want him to be the ruler. I don't want him to be in control of my life and heart and my mind. I want to do things my own way. <laughs> and that's why they're conformed to the world. I can... I can remember, I understand temptation. I understand it fully well. I remember a time when I was at a church, there were a group of people in that church where I was ministering to, and they were acting evil, absolutely horribly evil. They were cruel in every way towards me. They were focusing their, their hate at me. My life became a struggle. In fact, I didn't really even want to get up and go work at the church because it was just really bothering me. I had a non-Christian friend come over to my office and he talked to me and said, you know what, I know you're a Christian and the Bible tells you to turn your other cheek. So that means you can't do much about him. But I'm not a Christian. Do you want me to go beat the blank out of all of them? <laughs> you want to guess what was racing in my mind? <laughs> Yes, 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 please do so. Go, can I watch? That was what was racing in my mind. Do you know how hard it was for me to answer, please don't? I mean, I was at a crossroads right there. It was a crossroads trying to figure out how would I treat these people who were enemies of mine, especially when this non-Christian friend is willing to take them out. What kind of light would I have been to that non-Christian friend. You know, despite having the Holy Spirit in my life, I actually had to make a choice. Despite having the Holy Spirit in my life, I had to make a decision. Do I want to be like Jesus and cry out, Father, forgive them? Or do I want my earthly side to completely rule? Yeah, 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 go get them. You know what? That is not always an easy choice. It wasn't an easy choice for me on that day. Yes, the Holy Spirit is there to guide us, but we have still been given free will. And we will need to make proper choices. Purposefully choose to be like Jesus in every situation. So what does it mean to be conformed to His image? Well, let me propose four final thoughts. One is, we need to think like Jesus. I've heard many people complaining about coming to a church with Christians who aren't living out Christianity. Do you know, well, I don't want to go to that church because they're just full of hypocrites. You ever thought what it was like for Jesus every day, even with his 12 disciples? When Jesus would go up to the temple, were the religious leaders absolutely perfect living for God? Not even close. Were the worshipers there perfect people of God? No. 
when he selected 12 men to be his close disciples, were every one of them perfect? No. And some of you are going like, well, only Judas Iscariot. He's the only one who had problems, right? No. <laughs> in fact, there is one point in Jesus' life where Jesus has just been up on this mountain. We call it the mountain of transfiguration. Kind of appropriate for this sermon on transformation. Conforming to the image of a son. And Jesus is up there with three of his disciples and they come down and they find the rest of the disciples with this man who's got a demon-possessed son. And the other disciples are going like, we, we have tr not been able to cast out this demon. And Jesus cries out. And listen to this. This is his words. You unbelieving and perverted generation. You know who he's talking to? His disciples. You unbelieving, perverted generation, how long will I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? <laughs> Whoa. You think it was hard for him sometimes? Oh, yeah. Do you think it was easy for Jesus to live with and be with people who weren't as spiritual as he was? I'm sure it was hard. Yeah, I don't think it was easy, but Jesus chose to be with them anyway. He purposefully chose to be with them and even go to the house of sinners. To eat with them. To be with them. Even when religious people were criticizing him for doing that, he still chose to be around those people. See, Jesus didn't think just about himself. He wasn't thinking about, man, it stinks to be around these guys, these hypocrites. He was thinking about the lost, how he came to seek and to save the lost. He cared for other people. He thought about them. Do we focus our attention upon others, looking for ways to be with them so that they could know Jesus too? Even if they frustrate us? I know some people who, who shun being around others, who frustrate them. I know because I myself have been one of those. <laughs> But like all of us, we need to be daily transformed into the image of Christ, conformed to his image, so we need to start thinking like Jesus. We also need to talk like Jesus. Now, I'm not referring that we need to learn Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. I am referring to this speaking the truth with love. Jesus dealt with a lot of sinners. But have you ever noticed what most of his first words were? They weren't standing there yelling, pointing a finger, screaming, and accusing them of all sorts of sins in their life. When Zacchaeus was there, his first words to Zacchaeus were, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. To the woman who was caught in adultery, woman, where are those who were condemning you? Do they, does no one condemn you? Then he goes on and says, I don't condemn you either. Go, and from now on, sin no more. To the sinful woman who is washing his feet, your sins are forgiven. Although we may not be able to forgive people of their sins, we can actually speak with words of love and comfort and kindness towards others. It's funny to me that Jesus' harshest words that are recorded for us are actually reserved for the religious leaders. Basically, those who were ruling in the temple. But out in the world, when Jesus was among sinners, he spoke with kindness and love and compassion, even weeping for the people. How do you talk to others? Do you look at those people down the street? They're, oh man, they're a horrible sinner. Let's condemn them. Do you constantly tear down others and condemn those outside of Christ? Because that's not the way Jesus seemed to talk. Or are we showing people compassion and speaking in ways that, remember the sermon I had a couple weeks ago, that you would go out and make disciples, make people want to be more and more like you because we are kind and thoughtful and loving. Being conformed to his image means we're going to start thinking like Jesus. We're going to talk like Jesus. And we will love like Jesus. I don't know how long it will be before I feel I truly love like Jesus. I try, but my human side sometimes get in the way. Like the event in my life when I mentioned how some people were treating me absolutely horrible, it was hard to love them. 
I so much want to decide with my non-Christian friend and just let them, let him clobber them all. I long to be able to actually love like Jesus loves. That when people are abusing me, even physically, I can actually say from my heart and say from my mind, Father, forgive them. But that is something we're to try to grow into, to become like Jesus, conform to his image, that we would think like Jesus and talk like Jesus and love like Jesus, that we would act like Jesus. After Jesus was baptized, we read about him going out into the wilderness for a period of time, 40 days and 40 nights where he's fasting and praying. During that time, we read that in the scriptures that Satan came and he tempted him in all things. In each and every temptation, Jesus was able to quote scripture to show why he should not follow for the temptation, and thus Jesus resisted all temptations to sin. I look at that, man, I wish I could be like that Jesus and act just like him. Because sometimes temptations seem way strong, and it doesn't seem like there's a way of escape with every temptation. I mean, how did Jesus, after 40 days of fasting and praying, resist the temptation from Satan? Why don't you change these rocks into some nice homemade fresh bread? Ooh, doesn't that smell good? Make it into cinnamon rolls. Now there we're talking. Or chocolate chip cookies. You know, let's turn this into something good. Jesus, how are you going to handle this? Oh, let's make it fresh pie with homemade ice cream. Now are you going to resist this? It's been 40 days since you've eaten. I bet you're hungry. Wouldn't that taste so good? You know, it seems like every time I'm really determined to try to cut back and lose weight and cut back on the sweets for the sake of my health, I always face that temptation. Here's some chocolate chip cookies. Here's some donuts. Here's some pie. Here's some ice cream. And it's really hard to say no. We need to be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus who could resist the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. We need to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ who could resist all temptations. We need to be conformed to his image so that we can act like him and love like him and talk like him and think like Jesus. But it's requiring us to make a conscious choice that we would choose to become conformed to his image in every area of our life. Lord, I thank you for this passage. And I ask, Lord, that you would help us to be conformed to your way so that we could walk that path, so we could choose the right pathway to follow. Lord, help us to surrender completely to you in every part of our lives. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.